So let's talk a little bit about Matt Bevin and Matt Bevin's Kentucky. He's been the governor for the past three years. You had a Democrat right before him. In fact, the Democrat Party has been running Kentucky for the last, 70 years, 90% of the time, 90% of the time has been a Democrat governor. You've only had three single-term Republican governors uh, that has been in Kentucky. There are more Democrats than uh, Republicans, but there are some concerning, very, uh, they have Mitch McConnell, right, which is, that's uh, disgusting. Why the hell would anybody vote for him? Uh, the House and the Senate have both super majorities. So the Republican Party absolutely owns the state government. There is no room to breathe for Democrats, Republicans, liberals, Greens, um, independents, libertarians, you know, socialists, none of them. So it's all Republican. And um, there's a, something else I was wanting to mention, too, about its Republicanists. But there, it's, all, it's a Hillary Clinton state, so even the Democrats are Republicans. So it is a very right-wing state. It's uh, not, they can't embrace Bernie Sanders. They can't understand that we need to get up out of this poverty. They can't understand that. They're one of the poorest states in the union, 17% poverty rate. 17, one out of uh, five people, nearly one out of five people in Kentucky are poor. So to not address poverty, you've got a crisis, that's a death sentence, and if you're not going to do anything about it, what's the likelihood it's, you know, it's going to get solved? You have to admit that it's a problem, and you got to generate some plans, and you got to put those plans into action. If you're not even thinking about it, and you're not even putting the plans into action, the poverty is always going to be there because it's just like any problem that you got. Any problem, excuse me, <laughs> any problem that you got, you know, um, is uh, you need to address it, and you need to, you know, take it on head on. And so Matt Bevin, Matt Bevin. Uh, I will say this about him before I get into some of his policies. Matt Bevin has been put a professional face on Kentucky. I had never seen anybody like Matt Bevin in my entire life. I've lived in Kentucky for three decades, and so uh, I held on to it for as long as I could. But, you know, when there's just no room to breathe, it needs lots of progressives, lots of liberals, lots of new ideas. And uh, there's just, you know, it, I don't see it. I just don't see the machinery or the energy to actually solve the major problems that are uh, Kentucky is faced with. So when Matt Bevin got in there, I made a joke about how Will T. Scott and Matt Bevin were kind of the opposites because Will T. Scott was just, hey, I'm just a good old boy, and you know what you do to the least of my brethren, you do unto me. You do unto me. And so while I, you know, took the heart to that, I thought that was amazing. He was a very good politician. Matt Bevin was a good politician in a completely different way. He was, you know, educated by the U.S. Army. He learned leadership with the U.S. Army, became the captain. So when he gets up, you know, he's going to be strong. He's going to be firm. He's going to say what he thinks, and he's got his own ideas about things. He also was a very good politician in terms of shaking people's hands. If you shake someone's hands, he thought that that converted to a vote. Every hand shake, every hand that you shake is going to be a vote for you. And there was something about him, you know, coming up and shaking my hand. He came right up to me because I tried to say hi to him, and then eventually he came over and he talked to me. Um, and I don't think he was uh, prepared for my, you know, for me being such a big progressive. And I told him I liked how he said, you know, to Mitch McConnell, he's not going to run to the left of him, he's not going to run to the right of him, he's going to run right over him. <laughs> So great speaker, great fancy farm speech. So Matt Bevin is an incredible politician, and he puts a professional face on Kentucky, something I've never seen before. It's all politicians before. So, oh, I'm, I care, and I'll do this. And they're untouchable, and they're, you know, living in their own worlds and their own bubbles, but they don't really know what's going on on the ground level. So Matt Bevin is a very impressive politician. He's also been very effective at passing lots of legislation. Uh, I hear that he doesn't get most of what he wants, but the stuff that he has passed, you know, the carry concealed, the right to work, and the uh, heartbeat bill, uh, these are conservative issues. So you're going to elect a conservative. You want them to pass conservative stuff. So, you know, that's uh, essentially what he's doing. I, you know, I'm opposed to two of those, three of those things, but... Um, he has, you know, done his job. That's what he was voted in there to do, and he's been doing his job. Now, <laughs> I want to talk, uh, first I guess I'll start just with the good uh, policies that I agree with. 
I like that he is in favor of charter schools. I like that he questions public education to some extent, but he's sitting there telling the, the student, you know, the uh, teachers just to get back into the classrooms because if they don't, then they're going to get, you know, raped and murdered on the street. Well, the schools aren't the babysitters. The schools are there to educate, right? The babysitters are your parents. So to assume that if school is out, that these kids are in danger, well, then you're saying that the parents are crappy. Shouldn't there be some parental responsibility? So the, he's raised one hundred eighteen thirteen thousand dollars for his reelection campaign. Eight hundred thirteen thousand compared to two million to Edelin and one point eight to uh, Bershear. And then you also have a bunch of super PACs. Somehow the PACs are getting in this, and they have a shit ton of money, and they're going to put a lot of TV ads. So they're going to have, uh, you know, uh, they're going to do TV ads in the traditional thinking, the media, the way the media believes if you have the, you know, the person with the most money wins the election because you can afford the television ads that get your name and your ideas out there, whereas if you don't have, you know, a shit ton of money, then you can't get to the people. And the media is not going to help you get to the people. They're just a bunch of elitist fucking pricks. They pick who they like and who they don't like in the very beginning, and they just, uh, you know, influence policy like a motherfucker. Now, He's raised 813000 for a re-election campaign. He's born in Denver, Colorado, the Mile High City, but he was raised in New Hampshire, the live free or die state. I, meant, I said and die. You don't want to live free and die. You want to live free or die. So I'm going to live free or else, right? Give me liberty or give me death. So he comes from the New Hampshire state of live free or die. He's a, you know, an Army veteran, so he's been educated by the Army. A captain, he was able to get into, as, he was in there for four years, and he was able to get himself into a position of captain. When he gets out, he's a hedge fund manager, so he's making a bunch of money on these hedge funds. And I'm actually confused about what a hedge fund is. And every I hear lots of millionaires are making, you know. So probably if you want to make a bunch of money, find out what hedge funds are. Uh, he ran Integrity Asset Management, and then he's also the president of Bevan Brothers, a bell-making factory. So since he was, uh, I don't know if he's a millionaire or not, I guess he probably is, but he ran under, you know, being a successful businessman, and because he was wealthy, you had the Courier Journal and the Associated Press lined up, you know, like lap dogs ready to echo his every sentiment. So um, I want to talk a little bit about his economics, but I guess I'll get to it when I'm criticizing him. So let's just go with the things I agree with, okay? So there's um, uh, first, uh, Matt Bevin narrowly defeated James Comer by 83 votes in the Republican primary in 2015. So he actually has a great comeback story, runs against Mitch McConnell, gets trounced, right? So the Republicans are saying, no, nah, we're not going to send you to Washington as one of nine to go ahead and pass laws for Kentucky. But how about this, Matt? We'll let you run the whole fucking state of Kentucky. How about that? What do you think? And so it seems like a crazy contradiction. If you voted for Mitch McConnell over Matt Bevin, you're a piece of shit. Uh, if you voted for Mitch for any reason, but uh, Matt Bevin was just so much more impressive, younger, vibrant, and just had so much enthusiasm and uh, really wanted to make a difference. So... Okay, the things that I liked, okay, his carried concealed thing, I like. I'm pro-Second Amendment. I'm pro-Second Amendment because I'm pro-freedoms and I'm pro, you know, the United States uh, Constitution. One of the few things that I give the American Revolution any credit for is the Bill of Rights. We got the Bill of Rights, and the British tried to take our guns, but we kept them. And so the idea of just stripping something that's so foundational to our overall character, something that is fundamental in our Constitution, to just think that you're going to pass a couple laws, and, you know, if you really are concerned about the guns, then you can have a constitutional convention or you can pass an amendment to, you know, overturn the Second Amendment. That's the only way you're going to do it. If you're being serious, if you're being serious, if you just want to take a crisis and politicize it for your own, you know, political agenda, oh, there's a school shooting, so I guess we have to all have gun control. No, we're not going to do that. So we're going to have to do something else. Maybe after a school shooting we can start loving each other more and giving a damn and being nicer and really talking about these issues. What caused those, you know, psychopaths to murder innocent kids? What did, They're innocent kids too, right? What caused that to happen? So I think we should, you know, ask these questions. So he's for carry concealed for everybody. Uh, there hasn't been, you know, many incidents that I have heard of. So I haven't been paying attention to the day-to-day -day of uh, Kentucky life. Um, but uh, I haven't. Marshall High School, there was a shooting, but that was like three years ago, and nothing has happened since. He passed carry concealed, you know, two years ago. And so since carry concealed has been passed, it, it, it's been working. 
Excuse me. Okay. So he's in favor of carry kits sealed for everybody. He cleaned the Capitol building in July 2017, the first time the building had ever been cleaned. He passed a fiscally conservative budget. He has more investments in charter schools. He tried convening a special session to solve the pension crisis, which has been in crisis since the entire tenure of Bevin's regime. So he hasn't solved the pension crisis. He ran on fixing it. Uh, in 2015, but it hasn't been successful. I lo love the quote. He said, the tree of liberty is watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants. That is an incredible, that's an awesome quote. And this should make you think about the Constitution, the Revolution. It should make you think about a whole bunch of things. So the, the statement is, the tree of liberty is watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants, meaning that revolutions are, you know, it's a circle. Revolutions are cyclical. And there's something about revolutions that whatever happens in it, you know, the whole idea is to make everything better. So therefore, it, it's all justified. It's all, you know, hunky-dory. The quote comes from Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson also said we need a little rebellion every now and then. And then uh, he said every 20 years we need a rebellion. And the whole point, the reason why he said that is because they sent him as an ambassador, I think, in France. So while he's over in France, you have the other American revolutionaries, Madison, Washington, and all the rest, are sitting there writing up the Constitution, writing up a brand new government while Thomas Jefferson isn't even in town. And so while they're writing the Constitution, um, the Shays' Rebellion had just happened. Shays' Rebellion just happened. And so the whole point of the Constitution is to subdue rebellions. So we were revolutionary against the British, but as soon as our own people became revolutionary, then we got smashed. And so I think that that shows the character of our origins. The Constitution comes up out of that. You know, let's make sure we stop these insurrections, make sure the slaves don't ever, you know, rebel, make sure the natives are put in their place, and make sure, you know, Shays' Rebellion never happens again. He was a farmer. He fought in the American Revolution, then he was losing his land. You put your life on the line to, you know, he, meanwhile, George Washington, when he fights, he gets like 75,000 acres every time he fights a war. So the generals and all the top brass get a shit ton of land. Well, meanwhile, the low-level folks, I don't even know if they got paid, if they, you know, maybe just did it out of their goodness of their hearts. But if they did get paid, it wasn't enough to sustain them. And then what do they got to do? Go back to raising beets? You know, I guess if you got to do what you got to do, but uh, if there should have been some kind of social safety net and uh, Shays, Daniel Shays should have got a lot more sympathy than what he did. Daniel Shays is a, a fucking fantastic revolutionary hero in American history, and he's going to die a poor man, forgotten and alone. And so Daniel Shays is just a badass. So when Daniel Shays has his rebellion, Thomas Jefferson is out, you know, out abroad, and he says, well, the tree of liberty is watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants. That's what he said about Shays' rebellion. So Thomas Jefferson, he connected with the common man like no other person before. He's a revolutionary, and he's like, the revolution continues. The revolution doesn't stop. So I'm, I wasn't mad that he said that quote. Uh, Matt Bevin, the, he's, his campaign against Mitch when he said he was going to run right over him, that was just so fucking cool. And then he donates to Rand Paul. So Matt Bevin has some libertarian tendencies, but I don't think he would, he would call himself a Republican conservative. But he has libertarian uh, tendencies, so I think he respects the libertarians and he admires, you know, their resolve and their... The, the idea that they want to have fundamental change. He's also for a balanced budget amendment. So he wants to balance the budget, conservative budget, right? So he's not spending this much money. He's cutting the budget. That was a big thing between him and Andy Brashear. Andy Brashear sued him because he had an executive order. Matt Bevin did where he just went ahead and cut the uh, salaries of every single employee in state government by 10%. And Andy Brashear said you needed a legislative uh, uh, approval. You needed the legislature to approve of it. And so uh, they went to the Supreme Court and Andy Brashear won. And so Andy Brashear was right. The legislature has to approve of just a, you know, cross the board 10% cut such as what Matt Bevin had, had done. So those are the good things. There's one thing that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pro-choice. I won't say I'm neutral, but I will say that I'm not, um, I'm not like 100%. I think we need this conversation. I think we need this conversation. Okay? Abortion. So he's going to pass the heartbeat bill. Now, there's a lot of problems with the heartbeat bill. Um, he's very, he's super pro, you know, life. He's super anti-abortion. He probably thinks abortion starts at fertilization. 
and therefore, you know, there's no living cells in the sperm and the ovum. No living cells at all. There are living cells. Life has been around for billions of years, right? So when it comes to when does life begin, that's the, you know, the parameters of that discussion. It's, you know, some people say it's the woman's health. I think it's choice. I think it's choice. I think the, you know, the monikers are right. So choice versus life. So when do we get to choose when the pregnancy is okay, and then when do, does it become a life? Roe v. Wade says when the body is viable outside the mother's body. When it's viable outside the mother's body, then it is its own person. It's its own life. But the heartbeat bill says when they get a heartbeat. That's when life begins. So um, the, I guess I did think that life begins at fertilization. Like technically, that's when it all starts multiplying, and that's going to turn into a baby. And um, so technically, scientifically, yeah, life begins at fertilization, but when does the citizen of an American begin? When, does our, when do we become people, you know, in the eyes of the world? The morning after pill, I have no problem with the morning after pill. I have no problem with those who get abortion within the first or, you know, first month or second month, as long as they get it taken care of quickly. I do have a problem with murder. So if some people talk about abortion as if, like, you could abort your own kid till they're 18, which is bullshit. Uh, no, you can't. That's fucking murder, you psychotic piece of shit. And then partial birth, uh, you know, partial birth abortions are pretty disgusting. They said that they pull the kid out to where it's only a couple inches out of the vagina, so it's still in the vagina. It's still not born fully, and then they suck a, put a hose in the back of its head and then suck its brains out. And that's, uh, you know, that's not a typical tactic, and probably the only the few times, but I feel like nine months. Why'd you wait so long to get it? It's, you know, a fully for formed human being. Roe v. Wade says six months. So even Roe v. Wade is against nine-month abortions. So Roe v. Wade says it becomes its own viable entity at six to seven months, the third trimester. So that means the first and the uh, second trimester, abortions have been legal since 1973. Now... While I am pro Roe v. Wade, the whole viability outside the body makes sense to me. The heartbeat bill, it catches the imagination. So that actually makes it, you have a heartbeat, right? And when you have fingers and toes and eyeballs, the problem I have with partial birth abortion is it's a baby. It's a full-grown, you know, baby, full-fledged baby. And you're going to go ahead and suck its brains out? Could you get any more, you know, uh, disgusting? Could you get any more sick on how you're, you know, taking care of it? Now, there's some, there's a, a lot of actually evidence that says that countries with liberal abortion laws have less abortions because uh, they're having more abortions when there's nowhere to go and they're having more dangerous abortions. When you have liberal laws and people are more informed, people are paying attention, the, they know that, you know, they can get it taken care of if they have to. Nobody wants abortions. Everybody wants less abortions. Everybody does. Everybody wants less abortions. And so, uh, the, when you have liberal abortion laws, contraception, and you have education, and people are talking about it, people are more informed, and people aren't, you know, going out and making the, that mistake. They're, you know, being more careful, and they're being more uh, thoughtful about the whole thing. So, that's, you know, you want less abortions, then make it legal, have education, sex education, and have contraception, you know, free for everybody. And that will stop having unwanted pregnancies, Right. You're not, you're not going to stop everybody from having sex, so you need to make sure they're having safe sex and make sure they're being responsible. So I think it's a good discussion to, to decide, is it between the heartbeat? Is it between viability? Is it between one month? Is it between seven months? Where is that line of demarcation? The Supreme Court in 73 went ahead and decided this because the executive and the legislative branch of the United States, they did not decide it. They couldn't pass it. They didn't do anything. So if the executive and legislative ain't doing shit, then the judiciary went ahead and took it upon themselves, and that's been the rule of the United States. It's also how the homosexuality, uh, homosexual marriage is legal by Supreme Court decision because the you know, executive and legislator dropped the ball on this, and so the, uh, ex you know, the judiciary went ahead and said, here's what it is. And what I like about both of the Supreme Court decisions is it's thoughtful. They thought about it, they weighed the different interests out, and then they made a decision. And so because they were so thoughtful, I mean, it's almost like you can't fuck with it, right? The whole idea of precedent.
voted in as if it's been passed and, you know, if it's been a uh, law that's been passed in the past, then you're allowed to, uh, you, it's become, it's like constitutional law. You know, the idea of precedent basically means that they had it there, it's been there forever, so let's just keep it. Well, you know, some evil, slavery, right, the, some of these shit is just so goddamn evil, you have to uh, overturn precedent. So that means that Roe v. Wade is actually on flimsy grounds. It actually has no legal authority. It's just the opinion of the court of how it should be. And uh, until the executive and legislative branch actually pass something, that's going to be the law of the land. And so it could easily be challenged and overturned with just a simple law. All Donald Trump has to just, you know, sign a law and the legislature has to pass it. But the legislature, you know, legislature has to pass it, right? So that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Now, the problems with the heartbeat bill, lots of problems with the heartbeat bill. So the heartbeat can be detected from 6 to 12 weeks. So the heartbeat can be detected at 6 weeks. If the heartbeat can be de detected at 6 weeks, then that means you could have a late period, right? So at one month, you're saying, oh, God, I don't have my period. You wait a day, you wait another day, and then you wait a week. And then there's also uh, hormones, and then there's uh, stress, and then there's all these other, uh, you know, sort of... Um, mitigating circumstances that regulate a period. Most of the time it's, you know, every month, but sometimes it's not every month, and sometimes it's longer. So let's assume that it comes in one week late, okay? So that means you didn't know you was pregnant until five weeks in, and if you've been pregnant the whole time, then that means the baby could have a heartbeat in the week right after. Can you get, you know, a place to, uh, you know, have an abortion, to get a proper medical procedure to have an abortion within one week? And Matt Bevin, he's so, you know, anti-abortion uh, that he's been closing all the abortion clinics in Kentucky, and there's only like three of them. So he shuts down these abortion clinics that were, you know, destroying or that was helping all eastern Kentucky and northern Kentucky, and he shuts them down. And now, now there's only, I think, one place that they're allowed to have it, and since there's so much, you know, scrutiny on it, that's where everybody has to go. So you can only go to one place. So you waited five weeks until, you know, after five weeks you finally found out you're pregnant, then you have to get an abortion within one week to the one place that's really far away, and you're poor, you don't have the gas money to get there, and you, then you don't have any health care to pay for the damn thing. So, well, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And then the, it's a de facto ban on abortion. It's actually, it's very good uh, fig leaf. It's a de facto ban on abortion because you don't have enough time from the time you detect that you become pregnant to the time that the heartbeat actually forms. So sometimes it's 12 weeks, so sometimes there's three months, so there's plenty of time to detect it. But at the most extreme example, that doesn't, you know, it's not fair. It doesn't give that person uh, enough time to be able to make a, um, you know, an appointment and get it uh, professionally taken care of. So there's a dozen variables also on when the heartbeat forms. So between... Six weeks and 12 weeks is when the heartbeat forms, between one and a half months to three months. So before it was six to seven months, right? Roe v. Wade was third trimester, 24 to 28 weeks. So they said that states cannot make abortion illegal before the third trimester. So that's how the, you know, the law of the land has been six to seven months, and now the heartbeat bill is pushing that back from one and a half months to three months. And so is that better? I mean, that sounds crazy to me that they have to rush that quick to hurry up and, you know, get, I think there should be an exemption. I think there should be some kind of exemption um, absolutely for them. And so, yeah, I think I welcome the discussion. I am against the heartbeat bill. It's been, you know, knocked down. So it's been, I think they're challenging it at the Supreme Court level. But uh, it, the Supreme Court declined it before, so that just uh, goes back to the appeals decision. So since the Supreme Court hasn't ruled on these things, it's, it's not law yet in Kentucky, but it's been passed. And the whole idea of it being passed is because it's going to be the Jedi shot into the Death Star to go ahead and blow up Roe v. Wade. And it's intelligent and it's smart. So do not, you know, uh, take it for granted. Do not, you know, think, oh, that's just a bad bill and never go anywhere. It absolutely could. Georgia just did this. A lot of states, have been, a dozen states have, you know, jumped on this heart, heartbeat bill thing. Indiana or Ohio did, too. So this is a backdoor ban. It's a de facto ban on abortion. There's uh, a lot of things where essentially basic biology is being ignored. So that's AOC's criticism of it. And um, 
the whole idea between choice and life, I think viability makes more well, viability makes more sense to me because that's when it can live on its own. When it can live on its own, it's its own person. When it just has a heartbeat, well, is there a way to take it out? I mean, you're going to sit there and force, and then what about the health of the mother, and what about cases of rape and incest? I mean, I heard him talk about the health of the mother, but I haven't heard about rape and incest. I've actually heard some Christians say, well, that's a gift from God. Oh, that little kid got raped by that, you know, weird asshole, and that means now that kid has to raise that weird asshole's baby? No, get that shit taken care of. Fuck that shit. And, uh, and so I want to, you know, I want to hear Matt Bevin say that, too, in cases of rape and uh, incest. It's also, you know, the health of the mother, the cases of rape and incest is the exceptions. Clearly they're the exceptions. If you can't even say that they're the exceptions, well, then you're too much of a fucking uh, radical when it comes to the, uh, you know, abortion issue. So, you know, I got mixed feelings about it, but essentially, uh, overall, I'm against it. I'm pro Roe v. Wade. That gives you plenty of time to get it taken care of for third trimester. So, uh, first, second, you got six months, right? So, you got six months, plenty of time. This only gives you six to 12 weeks, so... Uh, that just, it's too much, it's too close, and so uh, I kind of want to learn a little bit more about, you know, when the heartbeat forms, and then how the viability could happen, could they pull it out, and then put it on the, under an incubator, uh, at what point could the child be under an incubator, and actually, you know, survive, and so if it has a heartbeat, right, is it going to keep on growing, does it have enough uh, energy and strength inside of it, inside of it to keep on growing without the mother, I mean, that's a question I have, but I'm against it. I'm against the heartbeat bill. I'm for Roe versus Wade. I'm for when the baby is viable outside the mother's body, that's when it is its own living entity. So before then, it is totally dependent. It's a parasite. It's totally dependent on the mother. So it's more just like a mother's organ, and you can get rid of your own appendix if you want to. And so it's a choice, right? It shouldn't be used for birth control, but if that's how it's used, then, you know, I say that's how it's used. But uh, responsible people, you know, you don't want to get abortion every week, so I feel like you would want a diaphragm or a shot. There's lots of contraceptions out there, way to get, you know, conceptualized. So, you know, be responsible. Be responsible. We all want less abortions. Everybody wants less abortions. So we want less unwanted pregnancies. So we all agree on that. We all agree on the end goal, less abortions. And then go back to that little girl that just got raped by that creep. If she gets an abortion under the heartbeat law, uh, or, uh, yeah, under the heartbeat law, and that's also, women are not going to tell the doctors the truth because when, you know, they probably won't get ultrasounds because, God, if you find out that there's a heartbeat, then you have to have it no matter what. But the, um, the, the little girl that gets raped by, you know, some creep, then she, if she gets an abortion, then she's going to go to jail. So the, and then she's going to get charged with murder. So I think that we got to, you know, come on, we need some common sense here. The day after, if you take a pill, the day after you have sex, you don't even know if there is fertilization. You don't even know if anything, you know, hit or matched up. And so even if it did, it's, you know, just this little tiny ball of goo, right? It's just little tiny uh, four cells. So because you took four cells and you put them in the trash, now you're going to go to jail for the rest of your life. So that's, you know, that's clearly not a American citizen life, just four little tiny cells. And if that is the case, so, you know, they do those, ex I mean, I, I, it's not the case. So, um, yeah, I think we need, it's a complicated issue, but I think you could put apply common sense to it. Now, I only have a couple minutes. The criticisms are coming up next video, so uh, that would be my most popular video, the criticisms. But he says kind of dumb things, but they're not that dumb. Essentially, he wants the teachers to go back to work. So Marshall County High School shooting, he blamed porn and video games, right? Gabe Parker killed two students, injured 14 others. So there was a shooting, you know, under Matt Bevins, Kentucky, in the first year that he was there. It injured 14 others. Two students were killed. He said, oh, video games and pornography. Video games and pornography, not child abuse, not, you know, police corruption, not a violent society, not uh, poverty, 
right? None of those things. Not the totalitarian atmosphere of a school system. Why is he for charter schools and then tell the teachers to get back to work? If you're for charter schools, then that means you don't really like public education, right? So he's just bleeding public, public education left and right. And I am in favor of universal education, but I think our public education system is outdated. It's the Prussian, um, the Prussian industrial education where it's all oppression and it's the bell system. So, like, the factory whistles and lunch and all this shit, you know, comes from Prussia, fucking Nazis. So we're, we've got a Nazi totalitarian education that's supposed to uh, develop us and make us go into the factories.